Hello and welcome to Amiga Tech, the series in which I take a look at effects I've programmed for the Commodore Amiga line of computers. In today's episode we'll be taking a look at three different ways of achieving dual layer graphics without using dual playfield mode. Let's take a look at that in action now and then we'll see how I did it. The first variant I created uses hardware sprites to create a 128 pixel white pattern which is then repeated across the screen. This allows for a 4 color background. The example as shown uses a 16 color foreground, but the sprite background effect will work all the way up to 6 bit planes in low resolution. The second variant is also a sprite background using a 128 pixel white repeating pattern. It also uses four background colors. However, this version of the effect uses far less memory. In fact, it only uses about 7.5 kilobytes of memory to achieve the sprite background. The third variant is a little bit different from the other two. It does not use any sprites at all. Rather, it uses the blitter and some bit plane trickery to create a four color background layer while achieving similar performance as using a sprite background layer. This means no repeating pattern is required for this variant. So why did I decide to create this effect? Well, the standard dual playfield mode of the Commodore Amiga, especially on OCS machines, is rather limited in the amount of colors it can show. It can only show seven foreground colors and eight background colors. Now, I've done an attempt at creating more foreground colors with fewer background colors before. You may remember the freeform sprite layer example I did a couple of years ago, but I was never really happy with the performance. The main goal of the three different variations I showed here today is to get better performance while still allowing that 16 slash 4 color screen mode. I want to point out that I am not the first person to think of using either sprites or even the blitter for creating a second layer onto the screen. My example may be newer, but that doesn't mean that older examples can't be found. In particular, we have several games that used sprite background layers, such as R-Type 2 and the much more recent Invia. When you're looking at using the blitter to create a dual layer mode, that too has been done before. There are also some examples here. The game Toki does this, as well as the much more recent Rygar AGA. All these games show that you can use a variety of ways of getting more colors into the foreground while still having a background layer. So how does this all work? Well, let's go over all of the free effects and see how I make them. The sprite background layer effect as shown here consists of three elements. The first element is the bob layer, which is shown on top of everything else. The second element is the foreground scroller, and the third and final element is the sprite background layer. Since the main focus of the effect is the sprite background layer, let's remove the bobs and the foreground layer, and then consider the sprite layer on its own. As the name suggests, the sprite layer uses the Amiga's hardware sprites to create a background. Since Amiga hardware sprites are 16 pixels wide, the sprite background layer consists of 18 of these sprites side by side. However, the Amiga can only display 8 sprites side by side before it runs out of sprite channels. This would limit the sprite background layer to only 128 pixels wide, which is not enough. To fix this, we make use of a rather unique feature of Amiga hardware sprites. If you reposition a hardware sprite in the middle of a scanline, it will simply repeat the data it has already shown for that scanline. This means that if we use the copper to change the horizontal position of a sprite mid-scanline, we can create a duplicate of this sprite. Doing so allows us to create a repeating pattern. We display 8 sprites, we repeat those 8 sprites, and then we repeat some more sprites until we have covered the entire screen. The advantage of this is that we do not need dual playfield to create a second layer. The disadvantage is that such a layer will have to use a repeating pattern which can be no more than 128 pixels wide. The copper list to create such a repeating pattern is fairly simple. It basically consists of setting up the sprite pointers so that the hardware can fetch the sprite graphics data for us using DMA, 
Then on each scan line the sprites need to be displayed. We first set the initial position so that they are at the leftmost side of the screen. Wait, set the position for the middle part of the screen. Wait again and set any remaining positions. To end the effect we update the sprite positions so that they are all off screen and stop changing them. This will give us a static background layer. If we wish to scroll the background layer, we simply update the pointers of the sprites to new graphics data. This graphics data will consist of pre-shifted copies of the 128 pixel white pattern such that each sprite can display all the various positions needed. Since sprites are 16 pixels wide, this would normally need 16 copies of the display data in memory. However, this would consume a large amount of memory, and there is a very simple optimization that can be done to lower it by half. By using the sprite control register, it's possible to move a sprite horizontally by a single pixel. If we combine this by changing the display window so it's one pixel smaller than the screen normally is, we can get by by using only 8 copies of the sprite data rather than 16. The remaining eight are then created by shifting the position of the sprites horizontally by one pixel in between each frame. Since the actual sprite repositioning in the copper list is done using the sprite position register, the sprite control register can simply be set once per frame for each sprite to obtain the required movement. Finally, the program needs to make sure that the priority register BPLCOM2 is set such that the sprites are behind the playfields and then we can add a single playfield display or even a dual playfield display on top of it. The example uses 16 colors for performance reasons, but if performance is not an issue it should be noted that this effect will work with any low resolution screen mode available all the way up to 6-bit planes. In many ways the low memory sprite layer is very similar to the standard sprite layer. Both use the same screen setup and both use sprites to create the background layer. The difference lies in the implementation of the background layer. Just like the standard sprite background layer, the low memory sprite background layer uses the copper in order to repeat sprites across the screen. However, unlike the standard sprite background layer, the low memory sprite background layer does not update the sprite pointers to new graphics data. Instead, it updates the sprite positions in real time to move the actual sprite background layer pixel by pixel. This saves a lot of memory as only one copy of the background needs to be in memory rather than eight for the standard sprite background layer. In order to make it possible to move the sprites like this, one additional sprite must be added to the sprite background layer. This is to allow the extra pixel data that needs to be shown. In other words, the low memory sprite background layer uses 19 sprites rather than 18 and moves these sprites across the screen in such a way that a seamless scrolling background is achieved. However, this approach has a serious drawback. If we use a standard copper list like we've done for the normal sprite background layer, we would need to update an awful lot of different sprite positions to get this done. This would take up far too much performance for the effect to be useful. Luckily, there is a solution. The copper allows you to make use of copper loops. By using copper loops, we can drastically reduce the amount of updates that need to be done between frames. This in turn allows the effect to lose only a moderate amount of performance compared to the standard sprite background layer, which increases the usefulness of this effect significantly. The blitter-based background layer combines using the blitter features of the Amiga Bitplane graphics and the special way of drawing blitter objects or bobs to generate a dual layer screen. Let's start by looking at how the Bitplane graphics features of the Amiga are used to enable the effect. One of the graphics modes the Amiga possesses is the dual playfield mode, which allows a two-layered screen. As it turns out, the Amiga always kind of runs in dual playfield mode. Even when dual playfield mode is disabled, the registers that are normally used in dual playfield mode to set separate horizontal position, Bitplane modulos and priorities still work. Normally, when you run in single playfield mode, you do not want to make these values different from one another. Otherwise, you'll get the kind of distortions you're seeing right now, with colors being processed incorrectly. But what's going on here? Why are the colors so weird? 
The answer lies in the different ways the Amiga interprets pixel data when choosing which color from the palette to display. Setting aside sprites for a moment, the graphics chip first looks at the shift registers to determine how many pixels each playfield needs to be shifted from one another. It then grabs one bit for each bit plane, adjusting for the shift value in the shift registers. It then adds the values of these bits together to get the index color. In dual playfield mode, this is done on a playfield by playfield basis. In single playfield mode, however, this is done for all bit planes together. This is the reason for the weird colors when you use different shift values in single playfield mode. However, you can actually set a color palette yourself that takes into account these differences and achieve a kind of soft dual playfield mode. This forms a key part of the blitter background layer effect. To explain this, let's look at some palettes. First, let's look at the dual playfield palette for a 5-bit plane screen. As you can see, this allows for a 7-color foreground and a 4-color background layer. The first playfield gets assigned colors 0 through 7, and the second playfield gets assigned colors 8 through 11. Now, let us look at a different palette which does the same but uses a single playfield mode. This palette uses all 32 color registers to achieve a 7 color foreground and a 4 color background layer just like dual playfield mode. That is to say, the color palette is selected such that drawing two colors marked as background involves drawing only the playfield 2 and colors marked as foreground, the non-duplicate ones, will be drawn to playfield 1. The colors marked as duplicate should not be drawn to. Those colors are the results of overlapping graphics between the foreground and background. If these rules are kept, using this palette will result in something very similar to dual playfield mode, with the only real differences being that dual playfield mode is not set and that the sprite colors are taken from palette registers 16 through 31 as normal, which in turn means that the sprites will share colors with the foreground. However, by spending some time with the blitter, we can go one step further. To see how, there's yet another palette. The third and final palette assumes that the blitter will be used to combine one of the bit planes of the foreground with one of the bit planes of the background, allowing for more colors in the foreground to be used. A side effect of this is that more different colors are available for hardware sprites. This approach allows for 14 foreground colors and 4 background colors, while hardware sprites get to choose from 8 colors shared with the foreground. As with the previous palette, only colors marked as background or as foreground, non-duplicate, can be drawn to. Now that the palette has been looked at, let's look at how the blitter is used to combine two bit planes into one. To combine two bit planes into one, we need several things. We need a single bit plane of background layer data. We need a single bit plane of foreground layer data. And we need a single bit plane mask of the foreground data. Of these, the background is the easiest as only two bit planes are involved. We simply draw one of the bit planes to a separate buffer as it scrolls along. For the foreground, we split the data into two parts. Three bit planes go onto the odd bit planes on the screen and the remaining goes into a separate buffer while it's scrolling. The easiest way to create the foreground mask data is to combine the foreground tiles bit planes into one using a paint program or something similar. This mask is then output to a separate buffer as it's scrolling just like the foreground. Combining the result of these three buffers into one is done using the cookie cut algorithm also used for drawing litter objects. However, doing that for a full bit plane would be fairly expensive, so the example program limits the background to scrolling at exactly half the speed of the foreground. This allows the program to scroll one frame using the display shift registers and one frame using the new blitter data. Combine this with double buffering the combined bit plane and the consequence is that only half of a bit plane needs to be processed per frame, halving the blitter cost. Finally, let's look at how to deal with blitter object drawing while using this kind of effect. Just like the foreground layer, the bobs need to be split into two parts. One part for the odd bit planes and one part for the combined bit plane. The part for the odd bit planes can be drawn as normal. The part for the combined bit plane needs to take into account the different shift value of the combined bit plane compared to the foreground. However, there is slightly more to it than that. Because of the way the combined bit plane is processed, the part of the bob that is drawn to it can't use double buffering. 
The solution is to draw this part of the bob in a single buffered way. However, this can cause display glitches. To prevent these, care is taken to make sure that this part of the drawing process is done while the raster beam is not on the visible part of the effect. There are several different ways we can look at the performance of this effect. The easiest way is perhaps by simply looking at the amount of bobs we can push in a frame before we run out of time. If we do that, we will see that the sprite background layer does the best with 14 bobs at 32 by 32 pixels it can show in a frame. The blitter and low memory sprite background layer do a little bit worse with 13 bobs at 32 by 32 pixels. But the blitter layer version does have the sprites available which it can add. From a DMA cycle perspective, they all use roughly the same amount of cycles. The sprite low memory uh, background layer uses a little bit more, about 10% than the others, but there's not really much of a difference between the sprite layer and the blitter layer. The reason that the blitter layer displays fewer bobs is purely because of the extra overhead incurred by having to split the bobs into two parts rather than being able to put them in one go. The last way to compare the performance is by looking at the performance of these effects versus a standard 16 color screen and a dual playfield screen. We can be quite quick about that. The dual playfield screen and the 16 color screen will outperform um, these effects in terms of the amount of bobs you can display and the amount of DMA cycles you have free. That said, several games have used sprite backgrounds in the past and I'm quite happy to see that the blitter background layer that I created performs relatively similar to a, a normal sprite background mode. So that's something to keep in mind should you want to try and use something like this yourself. The example program as is combines all three effects into one and as such it requires a lot of chip memory. This is in no small part because the way the memory is allocated is relatively lazy. As a consequence it might be a bit tricky to figure out just how much memory each of these effects needs in isolation. Let's take a look at that. For optimal performance the example program uses a pristine background copy to restore bobs faster. However, this uses a lot of memory and not all programmers use this method. Therefore, figures have also been included for code using a save restore method of restoring bobs rather than the free buffer method. Of all three effects, the sprite layer uses by far the most memory. Depending on the bob restore method used, it uses either 150 kilobytes or 189 kilobytes of chip RAM. The blitter background layer uses the second most memory of the three effects. Depending on the Bob Restore method, it uses either 125 kilobytes or 154 kilobytes of chip RAM. The low memory sprite layer uses by far the least memory. Depending on the Bob Restore method, it uses either 84 or 123 kilobytes of chip RAM. For comparison, a single playfield screen in 4 bit planes at the same sizes as I've used here will require either 77 or 115 kilobytes of chip RAM. This depends on the Bob Restore method used. Similarly, a dual playfield screen requires either 116 or 173 kilobytes of chip RAM, again dependent on the Bob Restore method being used. In conclusion, I'm happy to have revisited the dual layer screen effect. I've actually received quite a few emails over the past few years talking about my freeform sprite layer and looking into ways it may have been improved. That particular effect is just too CPU and copper intensive for me to consider it viable, but I hope that with these particular options I have shown that there are alternatives which can achieve more or less the same thing but with more performance. Now, if you've seen all this and think, I wanna try some of this myself, no problem, I have provided a link in the description below which points to an article on my website which goes into much more detail than this video, which also has a, a further link to the complete source code so that you can try this all out for yourself. 
I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you did, please like and subscribe, perhaps leave a comment or two, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.